Well, hi, everybody. I'm Don Stewart, and it's time for another edition of Breaking News. Today is Monday, the 8th day of April, 2024. And as always, we have some very important stories for you with respect to last day's Bible prophecy and how the world is amazingly being set up just as the Bible said. It's literally incredible what we see every day. Now, our top story, or our first story anyway, is the total eclipse that's going to take place today in large parts of the world. Um, please, understand that this has nothing to do with the last day's Bible prophecy. We talked about that earlier on a previous edition of Breaking News. Um, we've written a book called 45 Common Mistakes about last day's Bible prophecy cleared up. And um, in this book, which you can get for free, everything we do is free and free download on our website, Educating Our World, under this heading of Bible prophecy, 45 Common Mistakes about last day's Bible prophecy cleared up. Mistake number six, we should not look for astronomical signs to fulfill Bible prophecy in the present age. And as we explain, the signs in the heavens are for the last seven-year period, the 70th week of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble, or sometimes incorrectly called the Great Tribulation, which is technically only the second half of this final seven-year period. Anyway, it's a mistake to look for them today. So don't listen to anybody that says this is a sign of the end. No, it's not. It's a, it's a a natural event and eclipse that been taken place forever. So please don't see any significance in it. All right. Another thing, we have a program that we've stopped, we stopped doing on February 29th called Your Bible Questions Answered. We picked up, we did stop breaking news for a few weeks too. We picked that up. We're going to start doing Your Bible Questions Answered again. And the first program is going to explain to you the resources that we have and how you can use them and how it can be helpful in answering your Bible questions as we get back into it. And I think it'll be very encouraging and very helpful for you. All right, let's get to the headlines. Stunning is the best word to describe Israel's announcement yesterday that they're leaving the southern part of Gaza. Uh, the entire division left, 40,000 troops. They left one brigade, 1,000 soldiers there, removed its troops. To say the least, the people of Israel are angry, confused, and confused, and they just don't know which end is up now because of what has happened. And the problem what we're seeing are conflicting explanations have been given to the people. For example, uh, the defense minister in headline one, Yoav Gallant, said, well, withdrawal from Khan Yunus was merely in preparation for an operation in Rafa. In other words, we're leaving this area, um, and we're going to come back and do an operation in Rafa. And he said the withdrawal of the troops of Han Yunus was carried out because Hamas has ceased to function as a military organization in the city. That's why the forces left. Well, a few hours later, he backpedaled from that explanation because the forces in Khan Yunus are still functioning as a terrorist organization. We found five rockets that were shot from Khan Yunus as soon as they left uh, into Israel. Fortunately, no one was hurt from that. And so that confusion was there. The chief of staff... Uh, Halevi said, the war in Gaza continues. We are far from stopping. Prime Minister Netanyahu has said, victory's right around the corner. But the public asks, well, if it's right around the corner, why did you withdraw all these troops? And as we're going to see, Han Yunus was really a central uh, place, which we we're told for months that Israel has to take control of. But now they leave with only a thousand troops in the city. Now, another headline yesterday Egyptian sources predicted a temporary ceasefire this week. So some people thought, well, this is the reason they're leaving. There's going to be a temporary ceasefire. There's going to be some type of agreement for the hostages. And so uh, they, people got excited about it again. And of course, today, Hamas comes out and says, no, uh, there's no progress made in recent discussions with respect to the uh, hostages. The efforts to negotiate a ceasefire in Gaza have reached a standstill. So again, conflicting information. Now, another headline, stunning Gaza withdrawal. Is it from U.S. pressure or a strategy shift on the hostages? And uh, what about Rafa? Now, this story is interesting. It says now Israel will either need a new strategy or make bigger concessions to Hamas to get back more hostages. And it said, it, it kind of gave the inference there. This is before Hamas's announcement. That it seems some type of agreement with the hostages is right around the corner. Here's what it says. Some political and defense officials tried to offer, you know, reasons for how it was uh, hint or hinted to that was consistent with Israel's strategy to date to leave Khan Yunus. And they said, no, simply it's not. It's not their strategy to date. Why? For months, Israel's consistent strategy said the only way that the IDF could convince Hamas to return more hostages was to pressure it in its hometown of Khan Yunus. 
uh, Hamas Ga uh, Gaza Chief Sinwar and the military chief Mohammed Deef are both from Khan Yunus and would be personal for them if Khan Yunus you know, fell to the Israelis, they were caught, captured or killed, something like that. The best Hamas fighters were from Khan Yunus. Losing them would be an unspeakable, unspeakably demoralizing. Well, they haven't lost them. They're still they're still missing. And uh, withdrawal from Khan Yunus marks the end to the stranglehold strategy, the next point that's made. Over the last two months, the line has been as long as the IDF kept its forces at Khan Yunus, it acted like a stranglehold on Hamas. At any moment, the terrorist group would gasp for air badly and agree for a deal. Well, that was what was told the last couple of months. The withdrawal of forces from Khan Yunus on Sunday that ends this strategy and is an admission of failure. This is the word that's going on in Israel, an admission of failure, the, the uh, political solution here. Now, to make matters worse, some of uh, Netanyahu's allies on the right, uh, Ben Gavir and Smotrich, have said they won't continue. And uh, that, that, excuse me, that Netanyahu will not continue as prime minister without a Rafa incursion. Now, this is one of the things that we uh, did mention yesterday, but again, it's front and center now. If they don't go into Rafa, if they end the incursion into Gaza with where they're at, they withdraw from Khan Yunus and whatever they're going to do after this, if they don't finish the job, then Gavir and Smotrich, were two different parties that basically make up Netanyahu's coalition, that he cannot survive. Remember, it's a parliamentary system. You have to have 60 seats uh, you, with your political parties joined together, and their two parties are necessary for that 60-seat majority of Netanyahu. They basically said if the IDF withdraws from southern Gaza and ceasefire talks pick up steam in Cairo and there's no end to Hamas, then um, Netanyahu basically will no longer be a uh, prime minister. They're going to, you know, if he if he decides to end the war without a broad attack on Rafa, uh, Ben Gavir posted, uh, in order to defeat Hamas, he will not have a mandate to continue serving as prime minister. And that's one of the fallouts that's seemingly happening. Because remember, uh, what's interesting, Netanyahu, again, after the pulling out, says, well, victory is right around the corner. Now, if you recall, in November, Netanyahu said the fighting will go through all the way through 2024 and into 2025. And when he said that, he had to backpedal from that because the U.S. said, no, you better not say that because the world doesn't want to see this, you know, military strategy continue to go on. So anyway, uh, the takeaway from this is Netanyahu's in real trouble. He may not survive as prime minister. It seems impossible that he will. Now, if that happens, and Lord only knows what's going to take place in Israel. Now, the last headline, and this is the sad one, this is the pathetic one as far as the U.S. is concerned. It's, it's from um, Breitbart. Joel Pollack wrote it. How Biden brought Israel to the brink of failure. Before, it's a four-page article. I wish I could read it all. We don't have time, but here's some of the highlights. Before the war, Biden had already endangered Israel, first by restoring hundreds of millions of dollars in aid to the Palestinians that Trump had cut, including the terror-linked organization, United Nations Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, restoring that. Hamas, Hamas launched a war in 2021 after four years of quiet under Trump. And when Netanyahu won the 2022 election, Biden shunned him and supported protests against Netanyahu's judicial reform, fueling internal Israeli divisions. That's what was taking place at the time October 7th event occurred. And then it says Biden still hopes to pull a Saudi-Israeli deal together. He may succeed, but Israel will have to accept a Palestinian state and the threat of terror. And then there's still the prospect of a nuclear Iran. Let's not forget that, which Biden has done nothing and is doing nothing. And Iran, of course, um, they're sitting on, you know, pins and needles in Israel, afraid of what Iran is going to do. Tomorrow was the last day of Ramadan. And sometime after that, they threatened to do something, Iran personally. All right. So uh, Pollock makes a, a good observation. He says, at this stage, Israel basically has three choices. One, it can press ahead into Rafah hoping that Biden will not follow through with his threats. Remember, Biden has threatened to cut off military aid, has threatened to cut off, uh, uh, well, basically to stop Israel. And the U.S. is able to do it because the precision weapons they're using all come from the United States. So he's threatened to uh, basically stop supporting Israel. And they could go ahead anyway. Number two, they can change governments. Israel can, hoping that Biden is friendlier to someone who is not named Netanyahu. Or number three, 
Israel can wait until the American elections are over, hoping that Trump replaces Biden, or else Biden no longer constrains by fear of pro-Hamas voters, will finally help Israel win, as he should have, <clears throat> should have done from the start. <clears throat> so let's sum it up. Here's the summation. With the Iran threat looming and seemingly no hope for a soon release of the hostages, the people of Israel are confused with the withdrawal, with the withdrawal of troops from southern Gaza from a division from 40,000 soldiers to 1,000, a brigade, especially when Netanyahu says victory is right around the corner. His days seem to be numbered. So stay tuned, as things will only get worse for Israel. Now, as we continue to emphasize here, this is precisely how the Bible describes Israel in the last days, without peace, without friends, without leadership, and certainly without any clear direction as, as to how to function in the future. So what we see happening in Israel today is not an unexpected at all. In fact, it's exactly what the Bible predicts, what we expect to see happen and continue to see happen. It's going to get worse. They're going to be isolated. They're going to have fewer friends, if any friends in the world. And Israel will continually search for peace, but find no peace until the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when peace is brought to the earth. So many things are going on. Continue to pray. Pray that the good news of Jesus gets out, the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people of the Middle East, so they know there is hope in this world, because there's certainly no hope with the situation on the ground. I'm Don Stewart again. Thanks for watching. Until next time, as always, may the Lord richly, richly bless you.